Rain, rain, rain. Yes. But it could be snow, snow, snow. Dark and gloomy. Good day for a story. Yeah. I listened to the phone ring with, oh, spam risk. The sirens going up and down the street, they can sure be an interruption to a story. So I'm taking my chances now, hoping I've got enough time before the sirens come along again and the phone rings again. Now I promised you a story about my mother. First of all, you need to know I'm very emotional. You have to deal with it. I'm gonna start at the beginning. Do you remember the movie with Irene Dunn and uh, Barbara Bel Geddes, where they walked into a hotel and a lady was there named Luella Parsons. Now, many of you have no idea who Luella Parsons was. I remember her well. I remember her and Hedda Hopper. They were Hollywood gossip columnists. Etta Hopper wore gray big hats and they were in competition with each other. Now, Irene Dunn was the mother, Barbara Bel Geddes was the daughter. And they were carrying a big stack of papers. The daughter had written a book, written a novel. And when they heard that Luella Parsons was going to be there, they took a chance on meeting her and asking her if she would read the novel. She did. She took it with her, and a few weeks later, she was back. They met with her, and the daughter was somewhat disappointed when Luella Parsons said, you are a good writer, but you need to write about the things you know. And so the daughter went back home and that's what she did. She wrote a book entitled, I Remember Mama. That's basically what I'm doing now. I'm not putting it on paper. I'm putting it on video. And you won't get a detailed story because it's too long. You might not get half of the story today because it's too long. We might do this in segments. But tomorrow, is my mother's birthday. A hundred and twenty-seven years old. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Hundred and twenty-seven years. She was born. She lived to be a hundred and one. That you should know right off the bat. And I'm going to start at the beginning. 1897, this baby girl was born, named Molly Elizabeth. I think it's one of the prettiest names I've ever heard. It was 1897. You know that was two centuries ago? Yeah, two centuries ago. When you think about it, William McKinley was elected president that year. My mother lived through 18 presidents. And the odd thing about that election was the vice president, 
name was Garrett Hobart. Now, the reason I tell you this will come out later in my story. Vice President of the United States, Garrett Hobart. That was when my mother was born. Okay. Grandpa, they called him Pap. He had a 300-acre farm. Excuse me just a minute. Got to take care of the dribbles. 300-acre farm. He raised nine children. There were deaths among babies, and when they were young, some were young. But altogether, there were nine final, four brothers, five sisters. They all worked on the farm with the farmhands, with Pap and with Grandma. Now, Pap sold produce and his fruits to the market in Middlesbrough, Kentucky every summer. So it took a lot of labor to provide all of this food <clears throat> for the market. The youngest in the family worked just like the older one did. Two years old, the child could hold up two fingers. Tell you how old he was or she was. Two years old. That also told this child that he had to help plant the garden. Now there were mounds of dirt, and long rows, and the child would punch holes down into that mound of dirt. Then, in his hand, he would have two kernels of corn. He's two years old. He knew two kernels of corn. He placed two kernels of corn in that little mound and pinched the dirt on the top. That was his job on the farm. Grandma, with her newest baby, carried that child out to the cornfield, placed a little bassinet on the ground in the shade of a tree, and the family dog sat beside that bassinet and protected the baby while everyone else in the family worked in the gardens. Grandma would stop now and then to care, take care of the baby's needs. There was not an idle hand in the family. The girls, teenagers, hoeing in the cornfield, bringing in the wheat, oh, they worked as hard as the boys did. That's the way it was. My mother, she labored on the farm she went to school. It was a one-room school. She could tell me every teacher she had. She remembered all of her teachers, but she only went through the sixth grade. Pap says, girls don't need an education. Their work is on the farm, cooking and cleaning and working in the gardens. That's their job. They don't need a formal education. That was a big, big disappointment to my mother. She only got to finish the sixth grade. But you know, I always loved to look at her handwriting. She had the old English style handwriting beautiful, beautiful handwriting. She could spell. She could punctuate. 
and she knew good English, sixth grader. That didn't keep her from learning and teaching. She would have been a wonderful teacher. She knew so much about farming. She would tell me about grandma could raise the best beets in the whole community. What were beets to me? I didn't even eat them. But I knew that my grandmother raised the best beets in the county. Now the county was Lee County, Virginia and Claiborne County, Tennessee. Now, the reason it was two counties is because the house was in Claiborne County, Tennessee. The barn was in Lee County, Virginia. State line ran right between them. So I never really knew which one they paid their taxes in. So anyway, and I've got a few notes here. I have to look now and then so I don't get ahead of myself. They grew up on the farm where the apple orchards, peaches, Alberta peaches. Mama told me about the watermelon they raised. Have you ever heard of a uh, Georgia rattlesnake? It's not the crawling kind that you might think of. It's a watermelon that long with the wiggly green stripes down the watermelon. Mama said Pap would save the biggest one in the garden for the family. He carried it to the spring house and put it in the water to keep it cold. Now, if you have never drank spring water, I'm going to tell you that is the coldest water you will ever drink, and it is the best tasting water you will ever drink. I was 13 years old before I discovered that. Now, Mama knew the uh, all of the uh, signs on the Lady's Birthday Almanac. She wouldn't let me go to the dentist if the signs were above the waist because you might bleed and if you bleed, you'll bleed excessively, too dangerous. So I had to call the dentist and change my appointment till the signs were below the waist. She believed in those signs. She knew all of those little uh, astrological verses, you know, the one of uh, Red Skies at Night, Sailor's Delight, Red Skies in the Morning, Sailor Take Warning, and she could tell you the rest of the, the uh, poem. She believed those things. She could tell you remedies, the plants, anything you wanted to know about illness. Time and time again, I watched her in the kitchen with the onions and the sugar and whatever else she put in those little uh, poultice sacks. And they worked. She had her little bit of whiskey in the back of the kitchen cabinet. That was when you had toothache. Oh gosh, nothing worse than a toothache. She had her own remedies for herself, nerve medicine. I remember her telling me about Pap. See, Pap had a general store, and great-grandma Brooks lived with my mother's family. Great-grandma Brooks had two children. The first husband disappeared in the Civil War. So she remarried. She had 10 more children, that's 12. 
and she helped raise her new husband's eight children, 20 children in that one family. But when her husband died, Grandma Brooke came to live with Mama and Grandma and Pat. So we go from there. Let me see where I was going to go next. Let's go to when Mama became a teenager. Oh, I was going to tell you about Pap and, and Grandma Brooks' medicines. Pap ordered his medicines, you know, for the general store, and, and a lot of the farmers brought their eggs and their apples and their whatever they grew on the farm and sold them through the general store. But there was one thing that Pap ordered. It was called J-Pan oil. Yeah, I know. You're thinking, Japan. No, J-Pan oil. That's what they called it. And Pap and Grandma Brooke kept that medication under their bed. It was liquid, liquid medication. I don't know what it cured, but it must have been a dandy because Pap wouldn't put it in the store. He kept it at home. I've always wondered about that J-Pan oil. So that was just one of the little things that Mama would tell me about. And then, of course, she told me about Grandma Brooke going to the 194 St. Louis World Fair. If you're as old as I am, think back when you were young. Wouldn't it have been the grandest thing in the world if you could have gone to the Chicago World's Fair? And then after that was the St. Louis World Fair. Well, Grandma Brooks got to go to the St. Louis World Fair because one of her sons worked for the railroad company he was a supervisor, and he could get passes for Grandma Brooke to take the train from Middlesbrough, Kentucky, to St. Louis. And oh, what a tale she had to tell to her those granddaughters sitting in the swing in the breezeway. Now, the breezeway in those days was called the dog trot. A lot of you have heard of the dog trot. You've seen it in Western movies where you see the old hound dog laying in the dog trot between the two sides of the house. Yeah, that's where the swing was. So, Grandma Brooks told Mama and Aunt Renee and Aunt Cassie stories about St. Louis World Fair. You and I got to watch Judy Garland in the movie. Now, you have to admit, that's one of your favorite movies. Um, who was the band director? Famous, famous. He was at the World Fair. Of course, I can't think of his name, but I will in a few minutes. Okay, enough about Grandma Brooks. Enough about the kids time they spent with Grandma Brooks. They're getting older. Three sisters are already, no, just two sisters are married. One of them married when she was 16 and went out west with her husband's family. They went to Missouri and then Oklahoma. And Grandma, she's figured that daughter she would never see again, but she did, she did. They did well in Oklahoma. They had dairy farm and they sold their dairy farm to the community called Norman, Oklahoma, downtown 
Norman, Oklahoma, is where my aunt and uncle's dairy farm was, if you ever go there. Okay. Mama meets a young man at a, it's a church social. She'd never seen him before. Now, these church socials were about once a month in the good summer weather for young people to meet each other. They had no way of communicating. Everywhere they went was two and three and four and five miles. They'd have to go by horseback. So, the members of the church said, we, we have to have a way for the young people to meet each other, to socialize. So they had these monthly socials. And my mother spotted this young man sitting on a rock in the middle of the creek, the creek that came from the spring in the hills. Who is he? Gosh, he's cute. She was with her girlfriend. And the girlfriend said, oh, he's my cousin. Okay, they had what they called the uh, cakewalk. I suppose the girls all brought homemade cakes and, and the boys probably bid on them. You've seen that in the movies too. And the girls got to choose who they wanted to walk with. So my mother pointed to the good-looking guy on the big rock. I said, I want to walk with him. So they walked around. There was a long path that the, they followed. They walked around. You know what this young man's name was? Garrett Hobart Eastep. Remember what I told you about the vice president of the United States, when my mother was born, was named Garrett Hobart. I've never seen or heard of anyone else with that name. And I thought, what a coincidence it was. Did my grandmother know about Garrett Hobart in politics? Did she pick up that name from the Vice President of the United States? She may have. I don't know, but I just thought it such a coincidence that the young man my mother met that day was named Garrett Hobart. Okay, we're gonna move along. They want to get married. Oh my. Lizzie, Molly Elizabeth, was Pap's favorite. No, no, no. This was going to be a problem when Garrett Hobart came to ask for her hand. Pap just very quickly and very bluntly said, no. Oh, that's heartbreaking. My mother was almost 19 years old. And Hobart, Garrett Hobart, was already 19. They wanted to get married. What were they going to do? You'll guess it. They would elope. Oh my, I've seen movies and I've heard stories about elopement. They're romantic, but they're scary because those young people, what they had to go through so that they could be man and wife. Okay, you've seen the snow the last couple of weeks here and there, it's three inches, it's 12 inches, it's 18 inches, it's back to five inches. Okay, the day Molly Elizabeth and Garrett Hobart 
became husband and wife. There was 12 inches of snow on the ground. They had gone to Middlesboro. My Aunt Rachel lived in Middlesboro. She was married and had children. Well, they were going to have the preacher come and perform the ceremony at Aunt Rachel's house. Oh, they were a nervous wreck. My Aunt Rainy, who was the youngest of the five girls, she knew about it. Pap had to take Lizzie to Aunt Rachel's house. She was going over to help Aunt Rachel pack her belongings and furniture and things because Aunt Rachel was getting ready to move back to the farm. So Lizzie said, Pap, you'll take me over. I'll help. I'll stay with her that week and I'll help her get ready to move. Now, what was she going to do about her belongings? She was laughing when she said she wore two petticoats. She had two dresses on. And she had rolled up her underwear and, and personal items so tight and put them in her carpet bag. That's what it was called, carpet bag. So tight, trying to get as much in that bag as she could. And she figured, because it was winter time and so cold, Pap wouldn't notice how much bigger she looked with all those clothes on. So she got by with that. She, she had two or three outfits she was wearing to Aunt Rachel's house. Sunday morning came looked out the window, and there was 12 inches of snow on the ground. My mother and my father were married. He had a $10 bill in his pocket. She had her carpet bag, and they rode away on his horse, husband and wife. Now we're going to get into family, family, okay. Daddy worked for the railroad. He was a good worker. He got the job when he was 15 years old because he was orphaned. He had no place to go, no one to live with. He moved in with his sister Margaret for a while. And he got a job working for the L&N Railroad. 15 years old, no, no, he wasn't old enough. So he lied about his age, told him he was 18. He got the job, became one of their best workers. Two years have passed. Lizzie is expecting her first baby is they were living in uh, Baxter, Kentucky. She was having problems with the delivery. So Daddy followed the railroad tracks into Hazard. There were no street lights, no way of seeing. And this was the middle of the night. And he followed the tracks all the way into Hazard and found a doctor and brought him back. And he delivered Lizzie's first baby, Inez. Now, they would move from one place to another according to where Daddy was transferred with his jobs. Here was this newborn baby. Daddy was gone a lot overnight with, with on the train. That's where it was, on one of the trains. And Mama was with the baby, alone. The floods came. Oh, did they come. The water rose, and the house sat right on the edge of the water. 
she was so scared daddy was gone. What was she going to do? She looked out. She saw chicken houses. Houses. Chickens. Pigs. Cows. Floating down the river. When would the water get high enough they got into the house. Fortunately, she was safe. The water didn't reach to her house. This was just one of the little things my mother experienced. Another thing was, they got to live in railroad houses. When you lived in a railroad house, you got rent free. And the reason you got rent free was because you had to take in boarders. The boarders were men who worked on the railroad. You had to cook and feed those boarders. You had to do their laundry. So she prepared their breakfast in the morning, packed their lunches for them to take with them. They came back at night, ate dinner, and she did the laundry during the day for the boarders. She was pregnant. This wasn't an easy job for her. But life hadn't been that easy for her in the first place. She knew all about farming and hoeing in gardens and cooking. She was Pap's favorite when it came to cooking. She learned when she was 12 years old he liked her cooking best of all. So, it was no problem. And he had bought Grandma a Kalamazoo stove. Kalamazoo cook stove. Now, I'm telling you, that was one of the grandest things they had in that farm community, was a Kalamazoo stove. But, of course, Pap got one because had the general store and he was able to get her that big beautiful cook stove. So mama learned to cook for Pat. That's reason enough for him not to want to give her up to another man. Now we go on. She's pregnant again. This time they're living in the old log cabin where my daddy was born. I don't know how long they lived there, but this was 1918. You know what happened in 1918? Of course you do, if you follow history. It was the year of the influenza epidemic. Hundreds of thousands of people died. It was called the Soldier's Flu. The war was going on, World War I. Mama's brother, Will, was overseas fighting in World War I. But there she was. She had the flu. Daddy had the flu. Inez, two-year-old child. And Mama was about to have another baby. And old Doc Suttles was real concerned about her. None of them could get out of bed. They, they were there alone. Out of the big families in that community, two had managed to escape the influenza epidemic. That was Pap and my uncle, Uncle Lloyd, Rachel's husband. They went from house to house, making soup, building fires in the fireplaces and in the old pot-bellied stoves, enough to keep them warm. So Doc Suttles, was afraid the baby would be born and might be blind. 
My mother had that baby. She came out okay. Everything, everything went well. And my dad went back to work. And there were so many, so many that died. You can look in your history books, go on the internet and read about the 1918 influenza epidemic. And you will understand what my mother went through, how hard it was for her. I'm going to move on to the Great Depression. Oh my, you've all heard about the Great Depression. 1929 to 1941. Oh my, mom and daddy had a house full of kids by then. There was no work. No work anywhere. What were they going to do? Daddy took odd jobs. He could manage to get enough work to keep food on the table. And my mother was one of those people, she could stretch a meal, she could stretch a dollar. She was able to feed the family. And I recall my older sister Inez telling me once, being the oldest of, oh, you figure 10 years there, there were five babies born and there are already four. Um, what were they going to do? And my sister said, the only thing she ever wished for was a full glass of milk beside her plate when they had a meal. The grocer was kind to my dad because he could do our job for her. She was doing well. She owned extra property that needed repairs and things and she would call on my dad. And when he would go by to pick up the few groceries that the family could afford, when he got home, my mother would empty the, the paper sack and there would be an extra quart of milk for the kids. The depression years were bad. Anybody you talk to will tell you about the depression years. So what was it like when you had six or eight kids you had to feed and no work? Okay, it's 1934. By 1934, there was Inez, Ada, Cassie Pauline was a stillbirth, stillbirth. My brother, Bug, his name was Howard, but we called him Bug. There's three, there's three. Then there's my sister Velma. She was born in 1924. She was born in the house my daddy built, the house the family lived in to this day. So there's four. Uh, then there's Bella May and Jeanette, Betty Ruth, and Wanda. Wanda was about two months old. This was a bad time. Not only was it so hard making ends meet during the Depression, little Betty Ruth was two years old. 
she became ill. They called it dysentery. Some people called it the flux. Mama thought it was from eating green grapes. We had grapevines in the backyard. Mama thought she had eaten green grapes and had gotten dysentery. They didn't have penicillin in those days. So, you have a two-month-old baby. You have a two-year-old child that's going to die. That's not all. My sister Ada was in high school. My brother Bug was in high school. They had pneumonia. Nothing the doctor could do for them. While my mother rocked Betty Ruth, trying to keep the baby alive. Old Doc Smith came to our house every day and sat by the bed of my sister and brother. They survived. But the neighbors got together and built a little pine coffin for Betty Ruth. Now I have a picture of my mother, if I can bring it up, a picture of my mother standing beside Betty Ruth's grave. Take a close look. This picture looks a little bit warped, but she had on a beautiful dress and her lace-up white shoes, and there were the flowers on the baby's grave. That was 1934. Now, let's see. I've got other pictures here. Here's a picture of the barn on my grandpa's farm. You see that split rail fence? that divide the barn from the house. These are pictures I took. You can see the peak at the top of the barn looks a little strange. A tornado had come through and pulled the board away from the peak of the barn, but the barn remained. The barn is still there as far as I know. So, you know, it's over a hundred years old. This is a close-up of my mother in that same dress. It looked like a little cape with a flower at the neck. And her hair is either short or she had it pulled up in the back. That was my mother after about eight or nine children in 1935. That was a year before I was born. Now I'm gonna show you some things. We're just halfway through this story and you may not get to hear the rest. But I want to show you something. This is not going to be easy to do because I'm having to point the camera to the wall. There's a, there's a painting I want you to see. And I'm gonna try to get the camera where you can see the painting. This is not easy for me to do. Maybe if I stand up, I'll try to get closer to the picture. 
because I do want you to see it. And I'm having to look from the back side. Let me get a little closer. Can you see that? That is a painting of my mother. It was painted from a photograph dating 1915. Do you know how long ago that was? 109 years ago. This is what she looked like back then. Now, her hair looked like it's short, but she was standing in front of a big tree, tree trunk, and it had been raining. She said they were getting wet. Her hair was long almost to her waist, and she twisted it in the back like a French twist and pinned it up. So you don't see her long hair. But look at her dress. This is a dress over a long skirt. It's hard to see the edge of the dress, but it, it comes right across where you see a beaded bag. See the black beaded bag with fringe? And she's wearing the elbow length white gloves with this dress. Around the neck is an eyelet ruffled collar. Look at her waistline. A friend of mine painted this picture for me from the 1915 photograph. I treasure this painting. Now I'm going to move back if I can get me back in place. And I'm going to show you some other things. Just bear with me for a minute. I'll move this back a little bit so you can see more of me. You can see... Well, I would like for you to see her picture, but you can see the dress. Now, the beaded bag she held would have looked something like this. Only hers had long fringe. You can see it must have been a clear beaded fringe. You see this? That's the kind of bag she was carrying that day. She was wearing the long white gloves. Now, or it could have been a bag more like this one. That. Well, I happen to have sewn all of those little beads you see on this bag. They weren't there before when I bought the handbag in an antique shop. So I added rhinestones and pins and buttons and things onto the front. See the little butterfly right here? And some of those are buttons. Somewhere else there's a little bug. Oh yeah, right over here. Hold still now. Right there, a little bug. That's my handiwork. Oh, that's that. Now, this is what I want you to see. My mother gave me this. You've seen it before, but some of you have not watched that video yet. So I'm showing it to you again. This is not going to be easy. I have to be careful. What you're looking at is my mother's hair. 
I'm guessing she had her hair cut late 30s, maybe early 40s. Dark auburn hair, same color mine used to be. I wrapped the ribbon around it to keep it from shedding. You can see how old. This is probably 100 years old. Almost 100 years old. Yeah, almost 100 years old. My mother's hair. One of my treasures. So I thought you would enjoy seeing that. That's probably the best thing I have. Because it's so personal. I'm going to wrap it back up. Put it out of the way. Now, I have a couple of dresses that belong to my mother. And I'm going to guess she wore them in the 1930s. Now, these dresses had been in boxes a long time. I don't know if you can tell much about it or not. Let me get this pushed back a little more. Wrinkled, of course. It's got little scallops around the sleeve. The, the neckline opens down to here, and the scallops continue by the glass buttons. You see the almost sleeveless, not exactly. It goes on down and has pleats. Now what I noticed, I was looking to see if it was handmade or store-bought. I believe she may have made this dress because I looked close at the seams and I thought the strangest thing, she had shortened the hem on the dress The dress hem has been folded. They had hem about this wide. I used to wear them in that way. You could shorten them, lengthen them, whatever. It was easy to alter dresses in those days. But in this case, you see it in the extra flap of fabric. See that little flap? That was pulled up from the middle of the hem. You can tell how deep the hem is. Right here's where it, that's how deep the hem is. But the hem used to be even deeper like that. So obviously the dress was too long and she took the inside of that hem on her sewing machine, she put another fold in it and that's all she had to do to lengthen the dress uh, I'm trying to get the bottom that doesn't tell you a thing but this was one of my mother's dresses yes from the 1930s here is another one now, I think this one was store-bought because the, the flap down the front has a lot of stitching. These are plastic buttons. You see the little butterfly sleeve. These were the dresses my mother wore. I wish they were pressed and on a mannequin and you could get a better look and see the kind of dresses she wore. She didn't have expensive dresses. She always dressed nice. All of my sisters dressed nice. But they had an advantage too. They were pretty. Those girls were very pretty. I know that not only from having grown up with them, but the whole town knew those girls were pretty because they talked about them. 
how pretty these girls were. So, anyway, if I go any farther, we're going to get into World War II. And I've already written one story about World War II when I was age seven. I'm telling you that through the eyes of a child, you can find that video on my uh, YouTube channel. And I think you should read it because it is definitely a part of history. This is a long video I've just shown you and I haven't touched on the thing that my mother did. The illnesses she went through, there wasn't a lot of happiness back in those days because there was always war, uh, epidemics, your own children ill, not enough money, jobs couldn't be found. Oh, land sake, that just sounds like a horrid movie, doesn't it? Sounds like the grapes of wrath when I think about it. And I'll tell you right now, I'll never watch the grapes of wrath again. I hope you have enjoyed this so far. But I want you to know, when my mother passed from this world, she was 101. She was of sound mind. She was ready to go. I remember one day she said, Pat, why do you think the Lord has let me live this long? Well, now, let me tell you something. My mother could be cantankerous. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. If your mother lived to be old age, they can get cantankerous. Sometimes I get a little cantankerous, too. I looked at Mama and I said, Well, Mama, the only thing I can tell you is He's probably let you live this long so you can aggravate the hell out of us kids. That may sound a little weird to you, but I tell you what, it made her laugh. And anything to make my mother laugh, I would go for it. And I did that day. And sure enough, she put her hand over her mouth and started laughing. That was my mother. I was with her the night she died. I was the last person she spoke to before she went under. She was a good mother. She worked hard, very hard. Um, I never, never heard her complain about hardships. She never talked about having to cook all the time because she loved to cook. I can tell you that. She was a fantastic cook and she always had an extra plate of food for anybody that needed it. That was my mother. So, I hope you've lasted this long in this story. There are still things I could have told you. Funny things and sad things. But right now, whoops. Take a look at this lady in that picture. Wow. This is the lady I'm talking about. And I want you to get a good look at her. You see this lamp? Oil lamp? 
That was Mama's oil lamp. I remember the day we were walking through our house. The lights were off, no electricity. And Mama was carrying that oil lamp through the house. That's the only lighting we had that night. This was her sewing lamp. This is the lamp that ladies used when they were piecing quilts. And I've still got it. I hope it stays in the family as long as the lamp can last. Thank you for watching this. I know many of you have more, more interesting stories. But this is the one about my mother. Come on, there we go. Show us your face, Mama. Yeah, she knew she was pretty that day. Look at that handbag hanging down. Look at that waist. Yeah, she had beautiful hair. Thank you, folks. Mama's birthday, 127 years.